Broadcasting from Salisbury University campus, this is WSDL Ocean City, NPR News Talk 90.7. Putting Delmarva first. Stay tuned for Delmarva Today with your host, Don Rush. As we sit down for Thanksgiving dinner with family and friends next week, those less fortunate should be remembered. Welcome to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. Nationally, there have been over a half a million people experiencing homelessness. The state of Maryland did see an 8.4% decrease in homelessness between 2015 and 2016. That amounted to a drop from around 8,300 down to about 7,700. There has been an overall decline of nearly 30% since 2010 in the state heart of the Great Recession. But homelessness is not something that completely goes away, even in good times. In our studio this morning is Jim Barnes. He's with the Christian Shelter here in Salisbury. Welcome to the program. Thank you. So as we sit down for Thanksgiving, obviously next week, what kinds of thoughts go through your mind uh, at this time of the year? Well, I, the, it just gives me a picture. Sitting down at the table as a family, uh, the, and the biggest thought that comes into my mind is I've never seen so many homeless families in our population at Christian Shelter. It, it, these, and these are folks who, in some cases, as many as uh, seven children in a family. And sh the shelter, this a single room with six bunk beds in a shelter is home for them for Thanksgiving and their Thanksgiving dinner is in that shelter, and almost 40% of the homeless people in that shelter right now are children. Uh, so I think of a family sitting around a table for Thanksgiving dinner and think, boy, oh boy, that, there's a lot of families uh, with kids that don't have a dining room table to sit down at. What is it like for them to have Thanksgiving in a shelter like that. Well, it uh, it's not it's not all that bad to tell you the truth. It, it's it is a kind of a joyous time in the shelter, and one of the reasons is because we, I guess, in the shelter we got a pretty good sense of being thankful, uh, even when things are tough and things aren't as nice as as you'd like them to be, uh, because. We've got life and we've got some joy in there. And we've got a lot of people, a lot of folks out in the community whose hearts are touched and warmed this time of year that rally around and provide turkeys and Thanksgiving dinners. And we have groups that with joy come in on Thanksgiving Day and spend their Thanksgiving Day <clears throat> serving a, a wonderful big turkey dinner to our, our families in the shelter and not just having them line up and go by a, a cafeteria style, but they get to sit at the tables and, and the people who come to serve the meal, the volunteers who come to serve the meal, are waiters and waitresses and serve them at their tables and sit down at their tables and, and chat with them and uh, join in eating. So there's, there's some real kind of sense of family and joy they're even as tough as the homeless situation is. How important is that human contact, that humor in, human interaction for people who are homeless? Who, say, for instance, breaks them out of, say, maybe a certain isolation they might, have, might be experiencing? Oh, yeah, that's incredibly important. Incredibly important because a part of the, I suppose, a part of what goes with homelessness is a sense that for, for the homeless person that I, I'm not keeping up. Uh, so there's something wrong with me. Uh, I'm not fitting in. And I don't know, you know the feeling, especially in, in, in on a cold Thanksgiving evening or when it's coming up close to Thanksgiving and you're walking down the street and you're kind of looking in the, the lighted homes of folks and seeing families sitting around in there. Uh, well, if you haven't got a home, uh, and you walk down the street and see that, you feel left out. And so that human contact that comes with volunteer folks and their families themselves who come in and just and will sit down and eat dinner with the guests and, and chat with them, oh, that makes a big, big difference, a sense of uh, maybe I'm not 
<laughs> such a loser as I thought. Uh, somebody cares about me. And that's, that's a big thing. How about the children? How do they react? Are well, they aware of their situation? or? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a tough time for, for the kids, it, especially when they first come. You notice it most when they first come into the shelter. And they're coming in the, the uh, office to say, can we have a place to live? We don't have a place to live. And for the kids, I think that's, uh, they're confused and they're uncomfortable and they're, they get kind of rammy and, mm -hmm. and uh, this is not a, this is not what they like. This is an unpleasant setting to come into a shelter and see a, a lot of other homeless folks wandering around and think, geez, am I one of them? So it's, it's, a, it's an upsetting thing for the kids. And so it's important, again, that the human contact that goes on once they're in the shelter between uh, the staff and the children and between the volunteers who come in and the children, and we have some, now we're having some really good, strong programming that comes in for the kids, specifically directed at the kids, and that begins to help them to relax and feel a little bit more like a real child or a normal child. How, how do the kids get along? I mean, obviously with different families, do they bond? Yeah, yeah, they do. They do tend to, I think sometimes, in fact, because a lot of these families, more than half of the families we see are single parent families, and generally this is a single mom. And in most cases, the single mom is relatively young, uh, very limited education, very limited job experience, and uh, the father of the children has uh, disappeared and gone off and on his own. Uh, and they're, they're left in kind of a muddle. So when they get into the shelter, they're, they've got this panicky sense of, geez, I gotta find a place to live, I gotta find a job, I gotta get some income. And at the same time, I got to look after my children. And the looking after the children sometimes moves back down on the list. And so kids will tend to lean on each other. And particularly I see it with the older children towards teenage will tend to uh, almost become like parents, substitute mm -hmm. parents for some of the younger kids. So there is some bonding that goes on there and, and we see it. it and it, it does help to have, uh, we've got a, a wonderful group uh, from a program called LifeMark Counseling Services here in Salisbury that uh, who are all Christian believers and they come into the shelter and they sit down with the kids and and they do a wonderful job of helping the kids help to lift off some of the fear that causes kids to uh, to have difficulty relating to one another to lift that off and once you begin to lift the fear off why kids are able then to begin to uh, listen to one another and relate to each other and begin to play together. I see them out in the front chasing around in the parking lot. And so you mentioned a moment ago that you had programs for the children. What kind of programs did, do you have? Well, we started, I started with <coughs> the increasing number of families coming into the shelter. It used to be that the predominant homeless characteristic was single men. And that shifted greatly. Now, uh, single guys make up a relatively small percentage of the population and a much higher percentage is, is families with children. Uh, and so uh, it's, this is, a, this is a difficult thing and we saw that the, the disconcerting part of it, we saw people coming back into the shelter, coming once and then the same families. Uh, six months, a year later, boom, they're back in again and circling back in. And then uh, years later, we said, I've been at the shelter long enough so that I'm seeing now the children of some of the parents who were in the shelter years ago, that the, the instability gets passed down particularly if it's instability in a family, if a family is broken and uh, don't know how to communicate effectively with each other. And a lot of those mothers are very frustrated because they don't know how to communicate well with the children and the children don't communicate with them. So we 
got together with this group, this counseling group, uh, family counseling group, and said, we have a real concern for this. Is this sound like something that you could help us with? And they said, yeah, we'd like to get involved with this. Uh, so they've come in, and, and we do a series of, of, of workshops each week, one with the fathers, one with the mothers, and one with the children. So they're separate workshops, and, and a different group of leaders comes in with those and works with them. And then over time, they gradually begin to bring those groups together when they're able to communicate effectively with each other, when they've begun to learn a little bit about what it means to be a parent. Why am I a parent? Uh, it, it didn't just happen by accident. There's some design to it, and there's some real important purpose to it. So this, the LifeMark folks are, have been tremendously effective in, in beginning to, to put some stability in families. And that makes a difference in how, how they're able to hold a job longer, uh, retain and maintain a housing longer, if there's some stability and strength in the family, uh, if they're able to work together. Uh, so that's been a valuable, a valuable piece that's come along in the last oh, year and a half. What kinds of walks of life do they do they come from? In in many cases, particularly the the single parent families, uh, come from broken homes. The the parents them the mothers themselves grew up in a home where they didn't have much experience of a father around at all, uh, and so that becomes that gets passed on down to the kids. Uh, so, in many cases, like I said, the, the mothers tend to be relatively young, in uh, mid-late 20s, uh, early, some of them early 20s. And so they haven't, uh, they haven't had a chance to mature much, and they haven't had uh, an experience themselves of family, of what it means to be in a family, because they came in a broken home. Uh, came up in a broken home. So uh, it's, they don't know how to, what, how to deal with this and, and how to work on this. Uh, so the, we, it's, this kind of help is very important to, to begin to put some stability in their lives so that when they go out of the shelter, and they have to go back out in that world and uh, survive and maintain their own home. It, it's a, chances are a lot better that they're going to be able to sustain that and, uh, and become independent and permanently. So what kind of um, help would they get once they kind of leave the shelter? Are there resources that will ensure that, for instance, they either have some kind of income or some kind of job? And what... Because once you leave the shelter, yeah. you're kind of on your own. And, and, and the way the society works now is that you have sort of this myriad of various different agencies, which if you know where to go, it's really great. If you don't, you're not sure where, where to go. And there are, there are resources to help with that, with help with finding housing, with finding jobs. And, the, and those resources are improving. Over time, they're getting stronger in the area. The place called the One Stop Job Market that has a there's a lot of different resources under one roof there, that uh, do education programs, training programs, job placement programs, and and that's that's a big help. We also have uh, we've built over time some relationship with employers out there, and we have for example there's a construction company, a major construction company, that now will come and interview and screen men in the shelter, single men in the shelter for construction jobs and then they'll they will uh, they provide good starting pay and transportation to and from work from the shelter to get them started and get get anchored. So there's some of that going on too. There's some uh, folks out there, employers out there who who will come into the shelter and uh, and talk with folks and interview them and uh, so there are resources available to do this, and that, and it's been, it's that's been improving in the last year. Why that the possibility of getting a, a decent job has has improved considerably. What about the women who have children? How do they survive? Because uh, really? that's that's tougher. Because it's one thing to go to a job and you don't have anybody waiting for you. You don't have to take care of anyone. 
But you do have to take care of, like, children, for example. Going a job and trying to supervise them is obviously a difficult task. Well, it, it even starts for them at the point of going out looking for a job, doing job search and job interviews, and then you've got to drag the ch children along with you. Uh, and that, that doesn't make it easy to impress <laughs> an employer. Right. Yeah, but there are child care resources. Again, uh, they're, sometimes they, they cost some money, and, and, and that poses a problem for some of the mothers that we've got that don't have income. But there are child care re resources and help with child care. Uh, Shore Up is a, is a major resource in the community that, that helps out with that kind of thing. And there are several others uh, that, that help out with child care. So that, that's, that's available, but it's not always easy to get. Uh, and it, it, it's not always the best quality. We had sometimes hmm. you've got people who are licensed to do child care but for them, it's it's just a job. It's a way of making some money, and uh, we've had parents that have had bad experiences with with the childcare and had to give up or lose a job because the childcare was was clearly not working for their kids. You mentioned a moment ago that uh, you've seen an increasing number of families as opposed to the single men that we've saw in the past. Why do you think we've seen an increase in families? That's. That's or do a we tough know? question. I, uh, I think, okay, my analysis of this, and well, I don't, I haven't seen any real good research that can answer that question. Why? Why right. the increase in families? My sense is it's a societal thing. It's something that's happened in our society that those. Those things that we have in our society or have traditionally have had in our society that become strong supports for a family, especially when, when there's problems that arise, when financial problems come up or parents get bickering with one another over something. There have been support resources in the community, particularly connected with church, uh, with God, and with... The whole the way the school system works, the, the, the care and attention to families uh, that provide some help when times are tough. Uh, that, that would be, uh, you know, I think for a resource for a person who's running into some real struggles in their life and they can't hold a job down and, and they're losing their housing and they're struggling with that sort of thing. The two things that I would, if I were in that situation, that I would have, and when I was younger, most quickly turned to was one, my family, and two, to God. And I think the, and it's been a, government has played a part in this, and, and choices that people make, uh, a growing sense of, uh, I want to do it my way, and uh, in, in a sense of need for instant gratification, I, I, I want what I want, and I want it right now, sort of thing that, that battles against family. I mean, one of the reasons why I ask is because that, I remember probably when we started our conversations, one of the things obviously that hit was the Great Recession, and of course we saw a large number of people unemployed, and they were finding the fact that they, they either couldn't afford their house payments anymore or they, they found themselves homeless because they didn't have jobs. We look at this, obviously, the unemployment stats now, and they're very, very low, at least nationally and even statewide. Um, and yet we have this population which is not shifted back to, say, single men, but still families occupy this, uh, this space. And someone would ask themselves, well, gee, if the Great Recession is over, why haven't all these people found homes? Yeah, well, <clears throat> because there's less and less stability in the family. And the great during mm -hmm. at the time of the Great Recession, my goodness, families and and extended families rallied around and helped each other. Uh, when somebody lost a job and was hurt, and why there was always members of the family that invited them into the homes. <clears throat> far less of that today. Uh, far less stable families that really grow up learning <clears throat> to look out for and care for one another. Uh, and I think that's a part of our culture that, uh, and I'm not sure why that happens. 
uh, that so families relationships don't last very long marital relationships uh, it used to be that when you got married this was till death do us part right and nowadays there's a wink and a nod uh, before the, work out. <laughs> the guy who's, <laughs> who's married him that says uh, you know I, I reserve the right Right. <clears throat> to end this thing promptly if I don't like it, if it's not coming the way I want it to. What about blood relatives, though? I mean, we talked a moment ago. I mean, um, do you think there's a lack of um, family support uh, now as opposed I, yeah. to before? I mean, that where they won't take them. I mean, for instance, I know there is a phenomenon, particularly around the holidays, where oftentimes family will take some yes. people in during the family and during the holidays, with and then. Once the holidays are over, I guess the goodwill disappears too, and they and they have to leave. I mean, what's happened to that relationship? Do you think? Uh, I, I again, I think that's that in part uh, is a result of a religious climate hmm. that doesn't hold that this the sense of the need for structure and authority, lines of authority, and respect for one another uh, break down, and it makes it much more difficult for families to work out their problems uh, and it's a lot easier to just say well I'm leaving I'm going uh, and particularly it's easier for the guy to, to pack up go out the door and leave uh, a mom to to try to deal with the situation with the kids but I think this is part of this cultural thing a part of what's happened in our society that's uh, just robbed the sense of commitment uh, in families that hold them together. And it, 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 so I think, I think that's one of the reasons that, that we're seeing more and more families that end up homeless is because they, uh, the families are broken apart. I think it's to throw in something else. We're uh, experiencing an opioid epidemic. I mean, in terms of people... Uh. Dying. I mean, we, I think I saw a stat the other day. In Maryland, for instance, something 2,000 people died in, of an overdose, either opioids or heroin, in 2016. That's double what it was just there yeah. before in 2015. Um, has that epidemic had an impact on the kinds of families you're seeing or, the, or homelessness? Because uh, we're beginning to pay a lot of attention trying to deal with treatment and figure out what we can do for people. But obviously, if you have a drug addiction, for example, it's going to be very difficult to say, hold on a job necessarily. Uh, what are you seeing? Are you seeing any impact from that, uh, from that uh, phenomenon? Well, it's hard, to, it's hard to see that and yeah. identify that particular problem among the people that are coming in. But I suspect that that probably is, is again, a big factor in uh, the instability of families and the fact that uh, you've got so many broken homes and, and homelessness. Yeah, that probably is. In the shelter, we, the rule is you don't use drugs if you're right. going to stay in the shelter. Uh, but I, would, I wouldn't be at all surprised if that's the addiction One to the three factors. to opiates is, is not a big factor in uh, causing guys not to be able to hold jobs and not mm -hmm. be able to support their families. Uh, and families, mothers particularly with children, being set adrift uh, is opium addiction. And I don't know whether that's also a major factor in, in the, the female parents as well, uh, addiction to opium. Because it, 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 it's, not, it's not clearly visible to us with folks coming into the shelter, especially when they know that uh, if you, and we do drug testing of people in the shelter. And... I I would say that in recent months, the amount of times we have to ask a person to uh, take the drug test is increase, has increased somewhat. And the number of people that we've had to put out of the shelter uh, because of drug use, it's not huge or dramatic, but, but that, there has been an increase in that. So what do you um, what do you think is uh, going to be like over the next few years um, in terms of we seem to have a society now and we've seen it certainly in our politics it's been very harsh um, lots of angry words but certainly on the political stage we've seen that be 
everybody agrees. Do you think there's something that has changed in American society to produce that kind of acrimony, or do you think it's already oh, it's always been there? What's your sense about that? I'm, and well, I, you hear different yeah. you hear different stories of that, and you, and you hear every once in a while a historian will drag up the record of uh, two hundred years ago when they're in parapresidential races and how nasty they were. Oh, although I think they were more eloquent, but that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's what's going on. That's right. That's right. But no, I. Uh, it, the result of that kind of nastiness that you see at the upper levels, at the, among leaders, uh, elected officials and, and business people and people at the top, and that's where it's most visible, the, the, the use of, of anger and acrimony right out in public seems to be stronger and, and, and clearer. More, the divisions get sharper and people get angrier about them. But at the, at the level of the folks that we work with who, who are kind of struggling to, to make ends meet and keep going, it, I think that acrimony tends to instill in them a, a need for coming together. Uh, there, there's a hunger for, uh, for genuine relationships. Uh, and I, I, it makes it our job a little easier on uh, common the fires. I don't see, for example, I don't see as often now as it used to be 10 years ago, the potential for uh, guests in the shelter. And we have up to as many as 60 homeless folks living mm -hmm. in that shelter and almost half of them children. So the potential there for friction and fights is, is, is high. But I've, I've seen less friction and, and nastiness and fighting recently than, say, five, ten years ago. And I think a part of that may be that the public nastiness of my officials and all <laughs> gives people on, on our level a, a, a kind of a hunger for we want to uh, learn how to like each other and uh, and how to uh, so uh, I don't know it, it's a vague thing <laughs> right, to, to hang on but but I've seen some evidence that this is true that there's there's a di desire amongst the folks that come into the shelter to say we like to set some of the nastiness and quarrel and fighting aside. Uh, and one of the ways that shows is guests are willing to come to the office and say, uh, somebody's creating a ruckus in the men's dormitory. Uh, they're just irritating other people and people are getting mad at them and everything. Folks are willing to come and say, we don't like that. We don't want that. Help us out. Can you speak to those people and help calm this thing down? Uh, so uh, it's funny. There's, there's uh, people are more willing to, to to be upset about anger and strife and right. friction between between folks, uh, and and it seems to be a little easier to solve, resolve, and uh, calm arguments down when they erupt in the shelter. Does that give you hope? Yeah. Oh, sure. Sure does. Sure it does. Got something to hang, hang your hat on. And, I, and one of the reasons is because the prime things for all of the staff in the shelter is uh, do everything with respect and love for the for the guests, for the folks who are coming into the shelter. That respect and love are are, are crucial, uh, and and it's not always easy. The people I have people come in the shelter that make the hackles rise in the back of my neck and I want to <laughs> smack right. them. Uh, but always is this sense of, no, 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 that's not what I'm here for. Uh, that's The opposite of, of that is what I'm here for. I'm here to take off that sense of anger and frustration and struggle. Uh, so... <laughs> It's, you, you have your mission. <laughs> oh, you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we were speaking with uh, Jim Barnes. He's with the Christian Shelter here in Salisbury. Uh, and we appreciate you stopping by and chatting with us. Thank, thank you for giving me a chance to talk. It's... This has been Del Barber Today. I'm Don Rush. Thanks for listening. 
Thank you for watching Delmarva Today, a production of Delmarva Public Radio. Production and audio engineering by Chris Rank. Hosted by Don Rush. For podcasts, visit delmarvapublicradio.net or subscribe to the Delmarva Today podcast on iTunes. Delmarva Today can now be seen on Pack 14.